During the last few years, we've seen an unprecedented boom in the number of vegan-friendly products. Veganism has truly taken off as a lifestyle choice as much as a diet, especially in Europe and the United States, although some communities have been familiar with the concept for centuries. Even giant fast food chains like McDonald's and KFC now offer meatless versions of popular menu items. One report predicts that by the year 2040, as much as 60% of meat eaten globally will be created in labs or made from plant-based products. Sounds great. We can be pretty sure that eating vegan is better for sustainability as well as being a convenient option for people who have compassion for animals. But are we ready to make such a radical transition on a grand scale? And could there be any hidden costs, socially, economically and environmentally, to eating more of certain plants? The first thing to think about is carbon emissions. Livestock farming, especially beef, has a high carbon footprint. Animals release methane with digestion and need huge amounts of land and feed, causing deforestation as well as emissions from the production of what they eat. But there are plenty of plants which also make a significant impact in different ways. Transporting fruit and vegetables by air generates major emissions. For example, importing Peruvian asparagus and South African grapes to Europe or North America. The Made in Hackney organisation from East London aims to tackle this issue by teaching people how to grow their own food and cook with local seasonal ingredients. One of the things we try and do is make people aware of the produce that we're using and introducing them to things that they might be less familiar with. We have to focus on produce that is seasonal and local and ideally organic. So all of that will contribute to a more sustainable plate. We know that, of course, a lot of people will be shopping in supermarkets where there is food flown in from all around the world. And it's about having that awareness of seeing where the food's coming from, checking the labels. And we really believe that that is central to having a more sustainable diet. Other products with a high carbon count include mushrooms, which require a lot of energy to keep them warm. Then you have cocoa, a cause of considerable deforestation, and nuts, which are some of the most water-intensive crops on the planet. The wildly popular avocado also uses huge amounts of water, and with its rapid ripening cycle, planes are needed to make sure they reach us in time. As well as the emissions from transportation, Another key factor to consider is pollution caused by nitrogen-based fertilisers. The development of fertiliser has been incredibly positive for human health because it's enabled us to feed a lot more people than we otherwise would have been able to do. But in some countries that cycle has gone completely the other way and you end up with a lot of pollution because we put nitrogen fertilisers onto the soil and then those nutrients are going to waste at the end. So they are leaching into the water supply, they're going into the air in the form of ammonia and that's creating air pollution. It leads to stripping the soil of its nutrients, whereas what we could be doing is using the nutrients that are already in the system a little bit more efficiently rather than having to add them from the outside all the time. In world cities like London or Los Angeles, the idea of removing meat from our lives feels increasingly feasible. A number of companies have developed plant-based burgers that bleed with liquids made from vegetables and legumes. Others use animal cells to grow cultivated meat in labs. And some firms have invented steaks made with a 3D printing process. But what about parts of the world which don't have that kind of innovative technology at their disposal yet? In many African and Asian countries, for example, meat is a fundamental aspect of life on multiple levels. As well as being a crucial dietary element, livestock production employs millions of people. Small-scale farmers use their animals as a safety net against crop failures which are becoming increasingly likely due to climate change. Livestock ownership can also help improve gender equality in patriarchal societies, while meat, eggs and milk are a vital source of nutrition. Somewhere between a billion and two billion people around the world uh, depend in one way or the other on livestock to sustain part of their livelihoods. It is inconceivable to think of removing livestock 
because removing livestock from their livelihoods and from their lives would mean removing a really important source of food, removing a really important source of income, a really important financial asset which they can rely upon in times of emergency. It would mean removing something that provides them fertilization for their crops. It's also got a cultural and social function. So you're not just removing one thing, you're removing a whole spectrum of services uh, and values that livestock provide. And that cannot be easily plugged or replaced with something else. So, it feels like predictions about mass veganism on the horizon may be a little premature. It's an option that those of us who live in more highly developed countries are fortunate enough to have. A recent study in the UK indicated that plant-based diets are 40% cheaper than meat and fish, although some brands or products may not be affordable for all families. Experts say there is a health distinction between organic and factory farmed meat, which is important to remember. Meat has been the focus of this video, but let's not forget that dairy is also a crucial part of cuisine in many cultures. Eating more plants is a powerful tool for tackling climate change. But experts suggest we also need to develop more sustainable livestock production models, rather than simply calling to eliminate it altogether. We need to think about using the land the best way that we can. But if we all eat less meat, there's more land to do different things with. So there would be land for grazing some livestock. There would also be land for growing crops and there would be land for rewilding, which would also improve our biodiversity. So if people just eat a little bit less, then we have more options. Meanwhile, there's a regulatory minefield of rules around the safety and labeling of cultivated meat with products expected to hit supermarket shelves in 2023. How do synthetic hamburgers compare to the real deal? And will people be open to trying them? We'll leave that one up to you to decide.